If we live in the Spirit, so we're all living in the Spirit right now. Let us what? Let us also walk in the Spirit. So this is an important verse to point out that if you have the Holy Spirit inside you, you should walk in it. Then that means if Paul is commanding you to walk, that means that you don't, that there are times that you don't walk. That it's possible that you don't walk in the Spirit. So you know what the problem with Lordship Salvation is? Okay, what's Lordship Salvation? Now, you should have heard that like a million billion times by now, right? So this term, Lordship Salvation, in case for people who don't know, again, is thinking that you have to make God the Lord over all in your life. So your life belongs to Him. So because of that, you surrender all your sins to Him. You repented of these sins. So because of that, now he became Lord of all. He became the lordship of your life. And they tie that to salvation. No, if that's true, then why is it that Paul recognized that they are already living in the spirit, but it's possible they don't walk in the spirit? See, a lot of them will tie, they will use Galatians 5 on you. Remember this. They're going to use Galatians 5, verse 21, which we covered in our last Galatians study. They're going to use Galatians 5.21 to prove to you that you can't be saved. You can't go to heaven if you commit these sins. No, that's not true. Then why would Paul tell them to avoid these things and tell them that they should walk in the Spirit if he already knew that they'll be fine? <coughs> so this part is debunked when you use the next verse, when you use the verse 25. Use verse 25 and that will debunk their misconception at verse 21. Tell them this, oh no, they, they have the Holy Spirit in them. They're saved. No, uh, Paul Washer says, I can't, I don't see the Holy Spirit in that person's life, so wicked and evil. I don't sense the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit's not in that man. They can't be saved. Why? Because I don't see any spiritual walk out of their lives. No, they may not be abiding by the spiritual walk, but they're living in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is living inside us right now, but it's possible not to yield to it and walk according to what the Spirit wants you to do. Does that make sense? Amen. So use verse 25 to show that uh, this wicked person who's not walking in the Spirit is still living in the Spirit. You can use that. Okay, now let's return to our main text. Verse 26 here. Let us not be desirous. So Paul's telling you not to desire. Don't desire what? Of vain glory. Okay. You know what the problem is? This is the, the work of the flesh here. The work of the flesh here is where you want vain glory. You're desirous of vain glory. What's the greatest example, Pastor? YouTube. That's the greatest example. Pompous know-it-all. You can't even build your own ministry. You, because you can't build your own ministry, you want attention online. How many hits you have on a video? How many subscribers that you have online? How many comments fill up your videos? And because you're such a jerk and you want to criticize every other preacher that God is using out there, and then because why? You desire vain glory. And then when you don't get enough glory, you get jealous of God using some preacher who's better than you. He's blessing him more than you. You get jealous of them. And then what you do is you put on this Saul self-pity party. Oh, I don't know why people won't fellowship with me. And oh, I don't know why, you know, that I don't get enough people. We're in the last days truly, you know. I told you that apostasy will grow. Blah, 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 blah. And you're lost in the middle. I'm, you're lost in the middle of the woods. I'm lost in the middle of the woods. I'm living lost in the middle of the woods. Da, 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 da. Hey, so that's the problem with these people is that they put the self-pity party like, oh, I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake, and they go through depression. That depression, you'd be surprised, is mostly caused by you. And when I ask myself that question, that helps me a lot of times before I put the self-pity party mode out there. Now, of course, um, I expose wrong preachers out there, wrong doctrines. But Paul's pointing out here where he's talking about the saved brethren, especially if they're Pauline, Bible believers right here, if you are from this group where it's right doctrine 
and where your brethren, you can't be desirous of vain glory, wanting this. Everyone wants to compete to be a better preacher. Go to a big revival meeting, find vain glory in those preachers. All right? I go to a lot of conferences, and I'll tell when someone's trying to pull up vain glory right there. You know why? They feel like they have to compete, do better than the other. Okay. Sometimes you'd be surprised your best sermon can be the ones where you don't compete and you desire vainglory. One, one, one great example is, um, some of you already know this, but I was preaching at a, some revival meeting at uh, North Carolina, and the sermon that I preached that <laughs> got <laughs> stirred up the emotions of a lot of people, enemies and say Bible believers was a sermon that I had absolutely no notes and what I did was I went through hours going through a thick file of my sermon notes and I was praying and I was gathering all my thoughts and you know what happened the Holy Spirit moved in and say get rid of all of that Amen. and you just speak what I tell you to speak and the Lord used me that day yeah. Lord used me that day how so pastor I got those enemies mad at me I think that was my best sermon if I made them really mad at me <laughs> I got I hit my best sermon these a bearded guy and a balded guy crying about, oh, he, 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 name call my church and all that. No, I'll keep doing that. I don't care how much you cry, man. Because you, you prayed upon crying souls yeah. and hurt and damaged many ministries. I don't care how much I make you cry. Amen. All righty. Okay, anyway, so let's go right here. Verse 26, the second part, provoking one another. See, that's the thing. They deliberately pick fights envying one another. You get jealous of another person. You should never do that with the preacher God uses. The greatest example of a Christian, which I had to do, was where these preachers, um, they didn't work as hard. Okay, so I'm not going to put myself here. That way I don't sound prideful. Let's say you feel like that there's a preacher up there who didn't work as hard as you did, didn't preach as well as you did, and you know what? God blesses those people with more glory than you. And you know what you should do as a pastor or as a Bible-believing Christian? Rejoice with that individual. You don't get envious of that person. You don't deliberately provoke that person and then start to pick up a fight and then develop your own little cult movement. See, that's heresy. That's wrong. I showed you before that I don't hesitate to do that against heretics out there. All right? If I provoke them, make them angry, fine, man. I'm just doing what God wants me to do as standing for right doctrine. But when you're, when you're among the best kind of group who stand for right doctrine and then you deliberately nitpick something to provoke somebody envying each other, you're all alone, man. Yeah. Don't, you know what you guys want? All you want is vainglory. And guess what? God already gave you your reward. You already got the subscribers. You already got your blind followers. God gave you what you want. Yeah. I got something more than you. And guess what? God blessed me with some of those earthly glory that some of you guys got. The best thing you can ever do is follow what God wants, and he will give you the glory not just up in heaven, but surprisingly here on this earth as well. Amen. And the only evidence that I could probably prove is the people who definitely know me more, been online for a long time, or know me in person or attended this church. You see me from my bottom and when I climbed up. Let's look at uh, ver chapter 6, verse 1 now. All right, this kind of related to the preaching, and we have to wrap, wrap it up already. Wow, okay. So verse 1, brethren, so Paul is speaking to saved brethren here. If a man be overtaken in a fault, if somebody has a fault, he's overtaken by it, ye which are spiritual. Ah, if you're a spiritual person, you're not going to judge them. You're not going to accuse them. That's fleshy when you do that. Spiritual is what? Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Ooh, so you got to restore that person in fellowship. Help that person. Oh, that brother, that sister did that and that. No, no, no. You got to restore that relationship with them. If you're spiritual, if you're right with God. I mean, <laughs> that's what Paul said, okay? Let's keep reading here. Such, you restore them in the what? Spirit of meekness. You lack this one of the most important fruits. Now, you heard a little bit from the preaching today. This is necessary where you don't come up with the fleshy accusation, fleshy judgment, fleshy bitterness. It's I don't understand. And when you look at your own life in your own flaws, 
your own history. And when you do that, you put up with that brother and sister in Christ even better. Okay, let's keep reading here. I could have just preached Galatians 6.1, not Acts 21, this main service. Considering thyself. See, that's your problem. In humility, you're not considering yourself where you fell. Lest thou also be tempted. Wow. Now, this is an important thing you want to remember. You know what God's going to do? Yes, God will do this to you. One day, if you're not careful in restoring that brother, the Lord will deliberately test you in your life with something that you will fall in, a fault on yourself. And then what's going to happen is then you will be the person crying, oh, I wish pastor didn't judge me like that. Why does the pastor do it that way? Hey, you hypocrite, you did that. Mm. Lord will deliberately test you where your fault can be seen, and he's going to expose who you are if you're truly self, selfish, egotistic, or if you're humble and you recognize, wow, I've got to realize other people as well. Trust me, you don't want God to do this more on you. You're just motivating God to do this more in your life, and perhaps some of you are already doing this, but you don't know it. So this is something you better repent and get right with God quickly, actually. Uh, verse 2, bury one another's burden. So you're supposed to help carry the other person's burden. When you do that, what? So fulfill the law of Christ. And you fulfill the law of Christ. Ah, uh, this is important. So remember, again, there are two laws here. The law of the Spirit, or also called the law of Christ. And that differentiates from the law of the Old Testament. The law of the flesh, Paul called it, correct? So this law of Christ is automatically fulfilled when you think about others. Remember, the law of the Spirit, like I told you before, it doesn't have a lot of legalism in it, right? Details and rules. Why? Because all you have to do is, if you truly go by what the Holy Spirit wants you to do, automatically everything in the law is fulfilled. You will fulfill all the rules. The same thing with others. If you always think about others, everything in the rules will be fulfilled right here. It is important that you have to think about others, and that will naturally clean itself out. Here's a great example. We don't have to tell you about dressing all the details. Sadly, now we have to do it because churches don't see the difference, sadly. But concerning dressing, if you truly think about others, you don't need some preacher or some brother and sister telling you that some clothing is too thin or that your skirt is too high or that you're showing more skin or some guy's hair is too long, or he looks too effeminate, etc., etc. You don't need all that. Or that guys should take off their earrings and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. If you're in this church and then you see how people are dressed, you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to go, if I truly think about others, I'm going to have to start dressing right like they do. And do you know how many visitors I've had who came in for the first time, and when they look at us, they talk to me and they say, so pastor, uh, should I dress like this and like this and like this? They tell me. But what's surprising sometimes to me as a pastor is sometimes some saved people who've been saved for years don't see that. And that kind of concerns me because it shows that you probably really don't have a thought, consideration for others. It's self. Self. And that's why you have all these works of the flesh right here, problem here. 